Hello and welcome to the third lecture of sixth module. Uh, we have been discussing uh, the micro mechanics of lamina and in our last few lectures, we understood uh, how the constituent properties actually influence uh, the properties of lamina, both uh, the elastic moduli as well as the strength. And uh, we also understood the different approaches which are there in micro mechanics like mechanics of material approach, then elasticity approach, variational approach, uh, then uh, uh, semi empirical methods. But we have discussed in details the mechanics of material approach which happens to be the simple, uh, the most simple one. And uh, in our last lecture we have also understood how using the elasticity approach we could actually see the fiber matrix interaction especially when a particular fiber breaks what happens, what is the role of the matrix. We also understood the micro buckling uh, approach to failure of laminates under uh, compression load in our last lecture. So, in today's lecture uh, we will first uh, solve two problems uh, to appreciate whatever we have learned uh, how to determine the lamina properties in terms of the, uh, uh, the constituent matrix and fiber properties. And then uh, we will discuss in brief the experimental determination of uh, the elastic moduli and the staying parameters of lamina. Okay. To start with, let us take a simple problem. Uh, suppose in an unidirectional lamina made of glass epoxy uh, with matrix property like epoxy uh, Young's modulus is 3 gigapascal, transverse uh, Young's modulus of the fiber is given as 70 gigapascal, volume fraction that means fiber volume fraction is 50 percent. Uh, the, the transverse Young's modulus of the lamina is 6 gigapascal. Okay. So, using Halpin-Sy relations determine the transverse Young's modulus of a lamina made of same materials, but the volume fraction is 65 percent. Okay. So, uh, we already uh, discussed the Halpin-Sy relationship. Okay. So, in this problem it is given that given uh, the properties of epoxy epoxy is uh, Young's modulus of epoxy E m is given as 3 giga Pascal and that of uh, glass fiber glass fiber transverse Young's modulus is given as 70 giga Pascal. And given that a lamina is made with a volume fraction of fiber volume fraction of 50 percent 0.5, meaning that 50 percent fiber and 50 percent matrix, and that results in the Young's modulus transverse Young's modulus of the composite as 6 giga Pascals. Okay. We know we have already uh, learned the Halpin Psi semi empirical relationship okay which states that transverse modulus of the composite to the transverse modulus of the matrix is expressed as 1 plus xi eta vf 1 minus eta sorry 1 minus eta v f okay where where eta is given as e 2 f minus e m divided by e 2 f plus j e m okay and xi is the reinforcing factor actually halpin sai semi empirical method uh, he has actually obtained elasticity solutions for different fiber geometry and packing geometry 
and then with the help of carb feeding you obtain this relation that is why it is semi empirical method. So, this reinforcing factor actually depends on depends upon the fiber geometry packing geometry and of course, the loading condition. And this eta is actually you can see the expression it depends upon the relative Young's modulus. relative Young's modulus of the fiber and the matrix. And what is the physical significance? That suppose uh, say the uh, E 2 f by E m or for that matter E f by E m, suppose this is equal to 1, it implies that eta is equal to 0, this is actually for homogeneous. is for a homogeneous medium okay? or say if E 2 f by E m is very large say it tends to infinity that means, the uh, in that case eta is equal to 1, this actually represents rigid inclusions in a medium. Okay? this is what is the physical significance of eta okay or suppose say e2f by em or for that matter ef by em is equal to 0 it means if you put that here you get eta is equal to 1 by xi this actually represents void that means there is no fiber it is zero okay so there are voids so this is what is the physical significance of eta anyway now in this problem, uh, it is given that for V f is equal to 50 percent fiber volume factor of 0 0.5 and uh, E 2 and for V f is equal to 0 0.5, E 2 is actually given as 6 giga Pascal. Okay? So, if we put this in this, uh, we know E 2 f, we know E m, okay. we know E 2, we know E m. So, only thing what we do not know is xi. So, if we put this, we get in this, the value of xi comes out to be 1.2. You just check this. Okay. So, reinforcing factor in this case comes out to be 1.2 and when you put this in the expression for eta, this gives us eta is equal to 0.91 from this. Okay. Therefore, for Vf is equal to 0.65, we can use this equation eta is equal to 0.91 xi is equal to 1.2, we get E 2 by E m comes out to be 2.74, which gives us E 2 is equal to 2.74 times E m and therefore, E 2 comes out to be 8.2 GPA. So, using Halpin's side, we could see that when the volume fraction, fiber volume fraction increases from 0.5 to 0.65, the transverse Young's modulus increases from 6 GPA to 8.2 GPA. Suppose we use uh, the rule of mixture, uh, I mean, we use the mechanics of material uh, expressions. If you remember using using what we obtained from mechanics of material approach. 
V f by E 2 f plus V m by E m. If we use this put V f is equal to 0 0.65 E 2 f is equal to 70 giga Pascal E m is equal to 3 giga Pascal that gives us E 2 is equal to 7.9 giga Pascal. So, there is a difference okay? there is a difference between what we get using mechanics of material approach and what we get using uh, the Halpin psi uh, relationships. Okay? Next uh, let us take another problem this is a straightforward problem of course, but I have intentionally taken this problem in order to understand the failure of a lamina especially in longitudinal tensile failure. So, here you have to find out the longitudinal tensile strength and longitudinal Young's modulus of a lamina made of carbon fibers and epoxy matrix with the following properties. Given that the longitudinal Young's modulus of the carbon fiber is 250 GPA and the Young's modulus for the matrix is 4 GPA. Uh, longitudinal tensile strength of the carbon fiber is 3000 mega Pascal and the tensile strength of the matrix is 150 mega Pascal. Okay? So, if we try to find out the tensile strength, if you remember we have discussed these things in details that suppose this is strain versus stress. So, this is the stress strain curve for the matrix and this is the stress strain curve for the fiber and of course, the stress strain curve of the composite will be in between. Okay? So, we know that uh, at any point sigma 1 that means, the tensile stress in the composite is equal to tensile stress in the fiber into volume fraction sigma f v f plus stress in the matrix into corresponding volume fraction. How we get it? If you remember we have if we consider a an R v having fiber and matrix subjected to say load p, we know that p is shared by the suppose the by the fiber it is p f by the matrix it is p m. So, if sigma 1 is the stress in the composite, so it is the stress into area of the composite and at that point suppose sigma f is the stress in the fiber into the area of the fiber is p f similarly sigma m a m and from this we get sigma 1 is equal to sigma f a f by a c for a same thickness it is actually nothing but v f sigma m a m by a c for same thickness it is nothing but v m. Okay? Now, uh, we consider that failure of fiber implies the failure of composite or lamina. In that case, suppose this is the this is the stress strain curve for the composite. Okay? Now, what is the slope of this curve relative to fiber and matrix that is of course, decided by the volume fraction. If you keep on increasing the volume fraction, it will be more towards the fiber. If you keep on lowering the volume fraction, it will be more towards the uh, matrix. Okay? Now, when you load this at this point, this is nothing but the ultimate tensile stress of the fiber and this is the corresponding ultimate tensile strain. Now, at this point the fiber fails, okay? then 
since the fiber failure is the failure of the composite, we write that this is sigma 1 T u. Therefore, we can write uh, at failure at failure epsilon 1 is equal to epsilon 1 f u. What is epsilon 1 f u? This is nothing but sigma 1 f u by e 1 f okay, where e 1 is the longitudinal uh, uh, Young's modulus of the fiber. Okay. So, at failure this implies sigma 1 at failure we call it at sigma 1 T u. Okay. Therefore, we can write that sigma 1 T u is equal to the fiber stress is sigma 1 f u into volume fraction plus matrix stress. What is the stress in the matrix at this point? At this point, this is the strain. Therefore, stress is the strain multiplied by the Young's modulus of the matrix. Young's modulus of the matrix is E m. Therefore, this is uh, sigma m is nothing but epsilon 1 f u into E m into V m. So, this is equal to uh, sigma 1 f u into V f plus E m by E 1 f E m by E 1 f V m. Okay. Because uh, this is this is equal to uh, sigma 1 f u by E 1 f. Okay. So, from this we get. Okay. So, if we put these values, we can write this as, uh, so sigma 1 is 3000 mega Pascal into V f is 0 0.5 plus E m is 4 and this is 250 into 0 0.5. So, this comes out to be therefore, sigma 1 T u comes out to be 1530 mega Pascal. Okay. So, this is the ultimate uh, tensile strength of the longitudinal uh, tensile strength of the uh, lamina okay, in, uh, for a volume fraction of 0.5. Then we can uh, find out what is the longitudinal Young's modulus E1 of the lamina from the rule of mixtures Ef Vf plus Em Vm. So, when we put this values corresponding to a volume fraction of 0.5, we get this as 102 giga Pascal. Okay. So, uh, we understood how to actually find out the lamina properties say may be the uh, Young's uh, lamina mo elastic moduli or uh, the lamina ultimate strength using uh, the, the micro mechanics models. Okay. So, now we can whatever we have learned in micro mechanics what we could see is that uh, from micro mechanics we could actually determine the elastic moduli and strengths of lamina how based on certain stress tense state of the constituents okay uh, and considering an representative volume element uh, with certain assumptions what are the assumptions maybe in mechanics of material approach what are the assumptions we made if you recall that number one that uniform fiber spacing fibers are uh, of regular sh shape and size okay then perfect bonding okay with those assumptions we could get certain expressions for uh, elastic moduli of lamina in terms of the, the constituent properties of the fiber and the matrix and volume fraction. Similarly, for the strength properties also. Now, this uh, uh, though these actually serve as useful guidelines 
for uh, selecting the constituent materials. Suppose we want to uh, design a lamina, design a component for which we require certain desired uh, elastic modulus and desired strength. So, these expressions give us an initial uh, useful guideline to select what kind of uh, uh, the fiber and the matrix we will select, what will be the uh, volume fraction that is required uh, from the failure point of view. Okay? Uh, however, the as you understood in our previous lectures that failure prediction of micro mechanics is actually complex. There are interactions between the fiber and the matrix okay? and therefore, those uh, models based on simplified assumptions like the mechanics of material approach are not uh, always reliable okay? and therefore, they need to be verified, they need to be verified with experiments. Therefore, we need experimental determination of this uh, uh, elastic moduli as well as the, uh, the strength uh, properties. Okay? Now, when it comes to elastic, uh, I mean experimental determination of elastic moduli and strengths, uh, experiments could be conducted at defined scales, at micro mechanical scales, macro mechanical scales or at the component level, structural component level. Now, in micro mechanical scales basically experiments are performed to determine the constant properties say the Young's modulus of the fiber, the strength of, a, uh, of an individual fiber, okay? the, uh, the, the other properties of the constituents and maybe the interface properties. On the other hand, in macro mechanical scale, we find out the, the strength and uh, elastic moduli of the lamina. We actually conduct tests on lamina and find out the, uh, the elastic moduli and the strengths of the lamina and there are structural component level also. So, we will discuss in brief the macro mechanical scales experiments okay? and the objective of those experiments are uh, number one to determine the basic lamina properties to be used as input for design and analysis of uh, composite structures and also the results are used to verify the prediction of mechanical behavior. Suppose, we use certain uh, uh, say relations to determine the uh, uh, elastic moduli or strength of a lamina, uh, we can also verify that how uh, uh, well they actually agree with the experimental uh, results. Okay? So, to, to start with, first let us see the experimental evaluation of uh, say longitudinal Young's modulus, major portions ratios and the longitudinal tensile strength of a lamina. So, the details of the experiments are actually following ASTM American Society for Testing and Materials. Okay? So, this ASTM D039 gives us the, the full details of this experience, how to conduct these experiments, the specimen dimensions, loading everything. Okay? We are not going into that details. So, you can see all the details are available in ASTM. Okay. In this case, the specimen is actually 6 to 8 0 degree plies. Okay. These are all 0 degree plies. Okay. They are stacked together 6 to 8 0 degree plies are stacked together okay. and the specimen width or for that matter its ply width is 12.7 mm. The length of the specimen is 229 mm and uh, a portion of that is actually used to uh, grip the specimen as shown in this figure. Uh, there are end grips which are actually made of glass epoxy. Okay? In this case, uh, the grip length is actually th uh, 38 mm for on both sides and leaving around 152 mm for the specimen. Okay? And uh, two strain gauges are mounted, one along the longitudinal direction, another along the uh, transverse direction. I think you understood why we need these two strain gauges. One will measure the strain, the longitudinal strain and other will measure the transverse strain which is actually required to determine the Poisson's ratio. Okay? And tensile stresses are applied, it is actually loaded in UTM and the tensile stress are applied uh, at a rate of 0.1 to 1 millimeter per minute and then we keep on recording the stress strain data around 40, 50 data are recorded till it fails. Okay? Now, when it fails, 
we have the stress strain reading and they are plotted as shown here. Okay. This is the epsilon 1 that means the reading of the strain gauge which is along the longitudinal direction and this is epsilon 2 the reading of the this is given as minus because uh, when you apply the tensile stress along one direction that in the transverse direction there will be negative strain. Okay. So, the stress strain curve is obtained. Now, the slope of this curve will give us longitudinal Young's modulus. The slope of this curve epsilon 1 by I mean sigma 1 versus epsilon 1 will give us the longitudinal Young's modulus E 1 okay. and the point at which it fails will give us the longitudinal tensile strength okay. and then the slope of so E 1 is obtained as the slope of sigma 1 versus epsilon 1 and nu 1 2 is the slope of transverse strain to the longitudinal strain because only sigma 1 is applied. Okay. And we also get at the point of failure we get what is the ultimate tensile strain. So, we get all these three data from a single test. Okay. So, for a typical you know for a typical uh, graphite epoxy for a typical graphite epoxy we get E 1 as 180 giga Pascal then nu 1 2 as 0.3 I am just showing the order of those values because it depends upon the volume fraction uh, and the ultimate tensile strength is around 2500 mega Pascal. Okay. Now, observing the failure in a large number of tests it is observed that uh, the failure could be the brittle fracture of the fiber. It is observed that when the volume fraction is less than say 40 percent then it, the failure is mostly because of the brittle fracture of the fiber and when the in the intermediate volume fraction between 40 percent to 65 percent uh, brittle fracture of fiber and associated fiber pull out is also observed as shown here. Okay. And at a high volume fraction there is fiber matrix debonding. Okay. This is the observation uh, from the tensile failure of the lamina. So, from a single test we could obtain the longitudinal Young's modulus E 1 major portions ratio nu 1 2 and the longitudinal tensile strength uh, sigma 1 T u. Okay. Similarly, the transverse Young's modulus E 2 minor portions ratio nu 2 1 and the transverse tensile strength sigma 2 T u could be obtained. Uh, the procedure is same, but the specimen dimensions actually are different little bit different. What is the difference? You can see here that compared to the uh, tensile uh, longitudinal tensile testing specimen, the width of the specimen is more here it is double width of the specimen is double. Also the thickness of the specimen earlier it was 6 to 8 plies of 0 degree now it is 8 to 16 plies of 90 degree. 90 degree because we are trying to find out the transverse uh, properties. Uh, so, the width and thickness are increased to increase the failure load otherwise what happens it is actually they are very poor in transverse direction therefore, uh, if we make it thinner the failure load will be much less you may not get much time before it fails. So, and the specimen length remains same. Okay. Here also the strain gates are placed in longitudinal and transverse direction one is for the uh, uh, transverse strain gauge actually gives us the strain reading in the transverse direction which is required for determination of E 2 and the longitudinal strain gauge reading is required for 
determination of the minor Poisson's ratio nu to 1. Okay. Here tensile st stress are applied with a uh, rate of 0.5 to 1 millimeter per minute and 40 to 50 data points are taken till it fails and what we get from here? The slope of this curve, this is epsilon 2 and this is minus epsilon 1. The slope of this curve actually gives us E2. Okay. And the stress corresponding to this failure gives us the ulti ultimate transverse tensile strength. So, what we get is we get E2 from this reading, we get E2 as sigma 2 by epsilon 2. We also get nu 2 1 as minus epsilon 1 by epsilon 2. I think we have uh, defined the major and minor portions ratio already because in this case only sigma 2 is acting. Okay. And at failure, we also get what is the transverse tensile strength. Again, uh, for a typical uh, graphite epoxy lamina, for a typical graphite epoxy lamina, we get say E2 is the order of 10 giga Pascal, nu 2 1 is roughly point 0 0.017 and ultimate transverse tensile strength is of the order of 50 mega Pascal. Okay. So, as we have discussed already that uh, the transverse properties actually uh, do not agree well with the experiments and it is observed that the transverse strength in addition to the properties, of course, they depend upon the properties of the, uh, uh, the fiber and the matrix. In addition, it is also decided by the bond strength between the fiber and the matrix. If there is a presence of white that drastically changes the transverse properties okay. and during manufacturing, if there is a residual stress that also influences the transverse strength and modulus. Okay. Now, from these two tests, one is longitudinal uh, test, another is transverse uh, longitudinal tensile test and transverse tensile test. What we get? We, we get E1, nu 1, 2 from the longitudinal, from the transverse test, we get E2, nu 2, 1. If you remember that there is a restriction on elastic constants in orthotropic properties, like one we know that nu 1 2 by nu 2 1 is equal to E 1 by E 2. So, you can actually check whether they are, they are actually uh, following these constraints or not. If not following these restrictions or not, I mean we do not expect exactly suppose E 1 by E 2 in this case is 18, that does not mean that nu 1 2 by nu 2 1 will exactly 18, but it could be little here and there but it should not so happen that e1 by e2 is equal to 18 and nu1 2 by nu2 1 is equal to 2 that means there is something is wrong so this also gives us a check on whether the experiments conductor are correct or not similarly there are other restrictions we have discussed in our macromechanics analysis we can check those uh, the after we determine the properties we check that whether they are following those restrictions or not so that we can use these results with confidence okay uh, next is determination of uh, compression strength okay longitudinal compression again we follow the the one of the most recommended method uh, is following stm d3410 okay the details of this could be found here in this case the specimen thickness is 16 to 20 0 degree plies because we are trying to find out the longitudinal compression therefore all are 0 degree and the specimen width or the ply width is 6.4 mm, specimen length is 165 mm. If you see here that even though the specimen length is 165 mm, but except 12.7 mm, uh, the most of the lengths of the specimen are actually gripped. Okay. 
that means we put constraints on almost on the major portion of the length of the specimen this is to uh, uh, to eliminate buckling otherwise what will happen if we apply load if there is not sufficient constraint it might buckle okay therefore it is actually constrained in most of its length only 12.7 mm is left okay and strain gauges are mounted in the longitudinal direction on both faces of the specimen to ensure that they are parallel okay when we are testing the this it sh we should ensure that the specimen is straight and parallel therefore if that is so then uh, then uh, that strain gauges mounted on both the surface will give same similar i mean uh, same reading okay identical readings if not then we'll have to see that there are some uh, uh, error in uh, parallelism or the, st the 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 specimen may not be straight okay uh, then the load is applied at uh, compressed at 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter per minute and again till failure 40 to 50 data points are taken and we get longitudinal compression strength at failure okay so for a typical graphite epoxy we get u1 is equal to 140 gpa okay then new uh, sorry sigma 1 cu is 1500 mega pascal okay and epsilon cu 0 1 4 okay so this is uh, a typical you know for a graphite epoxy you obtain from compression uh, uh, longitudinal compression. Similarly, we can also have the transverse compression. Okay, the procedure is same. Again, the specimen is little different. So here the thickness is 30 to 40 90 degree plies. Okay, and the ply width is also little more. Uh, it is 12.7 mm. Okay, strain gauges are again mounted uh, uh, in the longitudinal direction on both faces to check for parallelism. Okay, and they are compressed. Uh, with a rate of 0.5 to 1 mm millimeter per minute and till failure 40 to 50 data points are taken and we get uh, like that transverse modulus from the slope of the curve typically for graphite epoxy it is 10 giga Pascal then transverse compression strength is of the order of 230 mega Pascal. and the strain compression strain at failure is 0 0.02 okay so uh, following these astm standards we could find out the longitudinal and transverse young's modli major and minor poisson ratios and the longitudinal and transverse tensile and compressive strength okay next uh, let us see uh, the determination of in plane you know shear strength as well as in plane shear modulus okay so among different methods one of the most recommended method for determination of in plane shear strength is we consider a plus minus 45 2s meaning that there are plus minus 45 lamina stacked in a uh, in a sequence like this plus 45 minus 45 okay this 2 means this, this sequence is repeated twice that means plus 45 minus 45 and s means then it is symmetric that means this is just a reflection of this. So, whatever is there plus 45 minus 45 plus 45 minus 45 it is now reflected as a mirror image now it is minus 45 plus 45 minus 45 plus 45. So, this is actually we will study this when we study the laminate in short it is written plus minus 45 repeated twice and the whole thing is symmetric okay so there are eight layers of alternating plus and minus 45 okay now this the details of this you can get in the stm okay now two strain gauges are actually placed okay perpendicular to each other this is strain gauge 1 which is along x and there is strain gauge s2 
which measures strain along y. Okay, this is x and y. Okay, and this is actually subjected to a axial tensile load along x. Okay, that means it is only subjected to sigma x. Now let us see why we will understand why we have taken why this plus minus 45 is taken. Okay, our objective is to determine tau 1 2 that is ultimate shear strain as well as g 1 2 that means in plane shear modulus. Okay. So, how we do this? Now, if you see the only stress is sigma x. sigma y are 0. That means, the state of stress with respect to x y with respect to this is x y okay, with respect to x y the state of stress is sigma x 0 0. That will lead to when it is stressed like this that will lead to strain epsilon x epsilon y there will be no shear strain because it is plus minus 45. Okay. So, this is the strain with respect to x y. Okay. Now, 1 and 2 are the principal material direction okay with respect to 1 uh, x and y 1 and 2 represent the principal material direction if you consider a 45 degree lamina if i consider a 45 degree lamina suppose so this is our x and y therefore this is 1 this is 2 it makes an angle of 45 degree. Okay. So, we can write the stresses in terms of the uh, with reference to the material axis with reference to 1 2 we can write what are the stresses sigma 1 sigma 2 tau 1 2 could be determined using the stress transformation matrix. Okay. We have used this number of times the stress transformation matrix. Okay. In this case theta is equal to 45 degree. If you remember the stress transformation matrix is cos square theta sin square theta twice sin theta cos theta like this. So, what we get here is that we can write this as cos square theta sin square theta 2 i sin theta cos theta sin square theta cos square theta minus 2 i sin theta cos theta uh, sin theta cos theta minus sin theta cos theta cos square theta minus sin square theta into sigma x 0 0. So, from this what we get is if we put theta is equal to 45 degree we get tau 1 2 is actually uh, sigma x sin 45 degree into cos 45 degree which implies tau 1 2 is equal to sigma x by 2. That means, when we apply sigma x there is no sigma y or tau x y only sigma x is applied that leads to in the material direction 1 2 a shear strain tau 1 2 which is sigma x by 2. Suppose this is our equation number 1. Similarly, we can have strains along 1 2 we can use the strain transformations epsilon 1 epsilon 2 gamma 1 2 by 2 is equal to since we have taken gamma 1 2 by 2 we can take the same stress transformation matrix 
theta is equal to 45 degree into epsilon x epsilon y I mean this is 0 anyway gamma x y is not there. So, this is 0 okay. So, if we put this what we get is again uh, we can therefore, we can write this let us write this. So, this is equal to cos square sin square twice sin cos sin square cos square minus twice sin cos sin cos minus sin cos cos square theta minus sin square theta into epsilon x epsilon y 0 theta is equal to 45 degree which gives us that uh, gamma 1 2 by 2 is equal to uh, sigma x sigma x sin 45 cos 45 sin 45 cos 45 minus uh, sorry eps, epsilon x sin 45 cos 45 minus epsilon y sin 45 cos 45 degree which gives us that gamma 1 2 by 2 is equal to epsilon x minus epsilon y by 2 which gives us that gamma 1 2 is equal to epsilon x minus epsilon y. Okay. That means, uh, we have applied stress sigma x and therefore, we know what is tau 1 2. What is tau 1 2? Sigma x by 2 and from the two strain gauge readings, we get epsilon x and epsilon y. Knowing these two, those two strain gauge readings, we know what is gamma 1 2 also. Gamma 1 2 is nothing but epsilon x minus epsilon y. Okay. Now, by definition, by definition we know g 1 2 is equal to tau 1 2 by gamma 1 2. So, if we use this equations 1 and 2 then we get this as g 1 2 is equal to sigma x divided by 2 into epsilon x minus epsilon y. So, knowing sigma x, knowing epsilon x, knowing epsilon y, we can find out what is g 1 2. So, uh, the, this plus minus 45 degree coupon is actually loaded till failure and we uh, take around uh, number of data points till failure and at failure whatever is sigma x divided by 2 is nothing but at failure. u is nothing but sigma x by 2 at failure. So, we get tau 1 2 ultimate we get g 1 2. Okay. So, this is actually the whatever I have uh, derived here is actually here. So, we get this g 1 2. So, this is loaded by sigma x and then the two strain gauges gives us epsilon x and epsilon y, this gives us epsilon x, this gives us epsilon y and therefore, we can find out what is g 1 2 from knowing the sigma x, epsilon x and epsilon y using this. Okay. Now, why we have taken plus minus 45? Because we ensured that, uh, uh, that uh, when we apply sigma x, there is a shear strain tau 1 2, but there is no shear strain tau x y. Okay. When you apply sigma x, it only leads to epsilon x and epsilon y and there is no gamma x y. Okay. And when you ap uh, apply sigma x, there is uh, epsilon 1, epsilon 2 and gamma 1 2. So, we could express this gamma 1 2 in terms of epsilon x and epsilon y 
and we could express tau 1 2 in terms of sigma x and therefore, from there we could get what is g 1 2 and at failure we could also find out what is tau 1 2 ultimate. Okay. Say, uh, now, what happens is uh, here also it is observed that the prediction of the ultimate shear strength is complex. Okay. Now, in our last class also uh, uh, I mean uh, we have seen that uh, to find out uh, to, uh, uh, to find out the uh, transverse and shear properties we have seen in our previous lectures that we could find out the transverse and shear properties from the simple mechanics of material approach, but they actually do not agree with the experimental observations. The reasons are that in addition to uh, the, the in addition to constant and properties of the uh, properties of the constant materials like the shear modulus of the fiber and the shear modulus of the matrix, it is also influenced by weak uh, interface. Suppose the interface is weak, there will be a drastic change in the shear strength. Okay. Then if there is a void, there it will be uh, it will have a huge influence on the shear strength and uh, shear modulus of a of a lamina. Okay. Then there is an inherent Poisson's ratio mismatch between the fiber and the matrix that also uh, has an uh, you know influence on the uh, the shear uh, modulus and shear strength of a lamina. So it is uh, um, when we try to uh, correlate these results with the uh, mechanics of material approach, they actually do not agree because of these reasons. Okay. So what we have learned today is that we understood that how to determine the uh, Lamina properties from the properties of the fiber and the matrix using say uh, mechanics of material approach where we have some simple uh, relationships okay, like rule of mixtures or inverse rule of mixtures and we have also uh, understood how to use Halpin psi theory, Halpin psi relationship to determine the especially the transverse uh, mo uh, modulus of lamina okay, and what is the what are the uh, uh, requirement of uh, experiments conducting experiments to determine the macromechanical properties of the lamina and once we determine that we can also check using the restrictions or the orthotropic properties of lamina to uh, to ensure that the the values we obtain from the experiments are correct okay so we'll stop here today thank you